Yes, I'm from Tully House Museum and Art Gallery Trust in Carlisle and I curate the archaeology collection there. Um, and my talk today is going to focus on gender bias. Um, gender, like all archaeological approaches, it's very much uh, vested in the scholarship. It's unpicked there, it's dissected there and it's discussed there. Um, and scholarship on gender has been uh, a very popular topic since about the 80s and before the 80s, so I'm not going to be introducing any new kind of uh, theories about gender. I'm going to be looking more at how the scholarship around gender affects our interpretation of finds, from their discovery through excavations and their um, representation in museums. <coughs> Um, as somebody in the curatorial side of things, it is the audience that I'm most interested in because they're the people who are consuming our interpretation of gender. I'm going to be doing this by looking at a case study from Tilly House Museum, uh, examining the impact of that case study on our audiences and then placing it in a broader context by looking at the wider sector. So my case study uh, looks at quite a famous site from Conwitton. Um, it was excavated <coughs> quite recently after um, a local method detectorist found a Scandinavian oval brooch, which, thanks to the Portable Antiquity Scheme, was identified um, and an excavation was uh, undertaken by Oxford Archaeology North, funded by Historic England, and the material came to us in Carlisle. Um, when it came to Carlisle, it was very quickly decided that this was too significant to put in a store, and a whole gallery was created for the site. Um, it's worth noting that this is the only Viking cemetery in Cumbria, and it is one of the only Viking cemeteries in England to be excavated and with modern archaeological techniques. So the significance of this site is national, if not international. Um, and this brooch here is the original find for the method detectorist, he found the other one to go in the pair for the burial, and it's basically become a symbol for this site. Um, this is a quick map listed from the excavation report. So grave number one was the grave where the brooch was found, graves two to six were discovered um, in the secondary excavation. Um, so in terms of gender, uh, I went to the excavation report and I looked at what the research aims and objectives were and how gender fitted in with this. Um, so from the primary research objectives, gender didn't feature at all. Um, it only pro uh, crops up in the secondary research aims and objectives as part of a wider umbrella to understand and characterise the dating of this cemetery. So you can see here, it's part of four, and there's other issues that are being looked at under this objective, such as culture and ethnic origin, the longevity of the, of the um, cemetery, and the sequence of the burials. Similarly, in typical museum style, we're focusing on people and the stories of people to try and bring in our audiences so we can all relate to this site. So our introductory panel to the, to the gallery asks the question, who were they? And it goes on to say, we're going to examine who they are, in terms of gender, but also their origins, their beliefs, and maybe what they were doing here in Cumbria. So despite gender being a significant yet smaller part of wider aims and objectives, it becomes quite clear that actually gender becomes one of the main focuses of both the report and the gallery. So here is how the report has separated the graves, exclusively into female and male, and I think this is so interesting because there are no skeletal remains on this site. There are only grave goods. There's one part of a cranium for grave one, and that's it. So the confidence that's placed in the ability to gender a grave exclusively on the goods, I think is, it's so confident to, to display and to present the graves like this in the report. And that is very much mirrored in our interpretation in the gallery. So here's a snapshot of our Vikings of Veal gallery. You've got little plinths, a lovely brown colour, um, to represent each of the graves. You've got a panel above which tells you uh, what they did in life and whether they were a man or a woman. And there's a variety of real and replica objects. 
Um, and although you can see that the, the panel is asking a question, a Scandinavian woman question mark, when you go on to read the panel, it's actually giving you definitive evidence that this was a woman. There is no, or it could be a man because this, this and this. It's, it's very much weighted towards this is definitely a woman. So what has the impact on this focus of gender had on our audience, Sister Tully House? Well, there is a section in the gallery where visitors can make little portraits and leave feedback. Um, and I started monitoring this. And I can tell you that I want to say between 80 and 90 percent look a little bit like with this. Oops. Don't get back here. Look at this. Um, this is both uh, adults and children. Um, and what strikes me is obviously absent, uh, absence of women, but the, not just the dominance of men, but the dominance of male violence. There's very few men depicted by children and adults that A, don't have horns on their helmets, or B, or don't have some sort of weapon or axe or sword in their hand. And the scholarship has gone so far to get away from the marauding, pagan, raiding Viking and this hyper-masculinity, and to actually talk about Vikings in broader contexts such as immigration and trade. So I just couldn't get my head around how this, was the most common perception of Vikings in Cumbria was male violence. I, I love this one. This kid's even written, Vikings don't have horns on their helmets, but I think it looks cool. <laughs> and then, so they kind of know, they know they don't have horns in their helmets, yet they're still going away with that impression. And maybe the fact that we sell horns with helmets in the shop isn't helping that. Um, it wasn't all male violence. These are two examples of non-male violence. So when men get old, they obviously become infantile and incapable of violence, so they can be portrayed as peaceful. And the women are always meek, mild and domesticated. So this idea of gender, it's not just man and woman, it's also age, and it's also your role in society. Uh, so why, why is this important? Well, it's important to me, obviously, because I'm a curator, and I want to be given the best impression of our collections to the public, but it's also integral to the workings of Tilly House. Uh, we are so lucky, we have such a forward-thinking manifesto, and pillar, pillar two of our manifesto tells us that we must examine, explore, challenge assumptions and conventions. It's part of what we must do. And this is backed up by the fact that we must have a self-critical attitude. And it's this manifesto and this leadership which has allowed me to do the research and the self-reflective work in our gallery. So what is the issue with the uh, gender bias in this gallery. It's not visible women. Women are very visible in this gallery. The, the brooch, the Scandinavian brooch, which is always associated with women, is the first thing you see when you go into the gallery. It's the first real object that you see. It's the, it's the object that's on the front of the excavation report. Women are very visible. So it's not an issue of finding the women. It's how we're interpreting the women. And to look at that, I actually looked at how we were interpreting the men. And there's so many avenues that I could explore, but for the purpose of 15 minutes, I've looked at um, swords. So this is from our gallery. And I researched how swords are interpreted through, through different Viking excavations and museums, and it seems to be this basic formula. Sword equals warrior. Warrior equals man. The visitor or audience takeaway from that is this. And that is leaving... All of the scholars go in, well, how did that happen? We've done all of this work to get rid of that marauding Viking, and yet people are still going away from our museums with that impression. So this is an example from Cumwin. Um, the burial one with the, with the two brooches, um, there were some objects from her grave in the plough soil. So it had some antler pieces and some beads. A sword of the same date was also found in that plough soil, 10 metres away from the grave. And the excavation report says it's clear that because it's a sword, it's unlikely to have come from a female grave. And I was like, well, why is it unlikely to come from a female grave? Is it because sword means warrior and warrior means man and therefore she can't have a sword? What's, what's happening? So I thought, you know, let's look at some other examples. And I've got two for you for the purpose of a 15 minute talk. One's from the very deep past, a very famous excavation, you're probably all aware of the Burka warrior. Um, this was... 1889, this sketch was done. So here's the warrior here, and you've got the very typical 
warrior regalia, you've got an axe, you've got a sword, you've got war horses, you've got spurs, you've got a shield. Um, and recent tooth analysis on the skeleton came back and said actually it's a woman. The chromosome was for a woman. Um, and that was then disputed because the documentation is apparently quite poor on this excavation. And it was said, well, you know, the bones have got mixed up in the boxes and maybe you've just analysed the wrong tooth. So well, whether this is or isn't a woman, I don't think is the important part. I think the important part is we're, it's easier for us to say poor documentation can't prove it than it is to imagine or conceive that there could have been a female warrior in the Viking period. Um, a more recent excavation, the 2000s, 2012, is this uh, burial from the Highlands of Scotland. Um, this was um, sex, the skeleton was to get through pelvis and dent, uh, his teeth, and it is a man. Um, shield boss, spear, sword, scabbard, warrior, obviously, um, except this grave wasn't a man, it was a child. He's between the age of eight and 14, he's certainly pre-puberty. So was a child a warrior? Or is the sword an indication of something else? These are just two examples. There's so many examples in between. Do these two examples alone, are they enough for us to say, well, maybe that isn't 100% always the case? Um, it's not just me, thank God. Um, the Museums Association put out this poll two years ago and they asked us, um, is enough care being done to make sure that our exhibitions aren't reinforcing gender stereotypes. 82% of museum professionals came back and said, no, we're not doing enough. So uh, who is responsible for this? Well, um, <laughs> it is men, um, but it's a specific type of men, um, antiquarian men. Um, if you think about Falcon Witten, the fact that this is the only Viking excavation to be done with modern archaeological methods, we really are relying on the deep past or so the more recent past and their gender conclusions to determine whether we are deciding if something is male or female. Um, I know there's some curators in the room here, you've probably got something similar in your collection at home. This is from Tilly House, it's a, a phallic um, graven from Bird, Bird, Bird Oswald Fort on Hadrian's Wall and it's uh, in our catalogue as a curious carving representing a pair of shears. Um, <laughs> And I think that's quite easy for us to go, oh, God, that's just antiquarians being, you know, uptight about sex. So we can dismiss that. But I think the other elements that antiquarians have left us with, the ideas that swords and violence is male and brooches and pretty things are female, they still suit our narrative today about gender. And that's why we're finding it so hard to shake away from it. But, you know, this is me, by the way, uh, <laughs> thinking, well, is it really good enough to just blame antiquarians, the old dead man? We can't. Is it good enough to say, oh, it's just them being sexist? Well, actually, I don't think it is. I think it's all of our responsibility. And what I would like is for there to be a more interdisciplinary approach to this. I think that researchers, scholars, curators, uh, fine specialists, um, community archaeologists, literary critics and historians, we all need to get together and really interrogate this evidence. How many of those Scandinavian oval brooches are from burials where the skeletons have been scientifically sexed? How many of, saw, of the swords have been from burials which have been scientifically sexed? What methods of sexing, are we looking at pelvis or DNA, are we saying is good enough to prove the sex of a skeleton? And you know, what, um, what are we saying about the relationship between sex and gender in this period? Um, and I think that really the only way we're going to measure our success is when we go to our audiences and they are not drawing just pictures of male violence, that male violence can move to a space that is still there, but there is more space left for our visitors to go away with the idea of the Scandinav Scandinavian world as being diverse and relevant and interesting. Thank you.